All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. We're going to have a, a discussion on endoscopic spine surgery and the uh, title of this presentation is Endoscopic Spine Surgery, What is the Hype? Um, we've been advertising uh, endoscopic spine surgery. We started this at Ohio Valley and, um, and we've had great success with it so far. And so I wanted to kind of give a little bit of an open forum uh, for uh, patients to um, and providers um, and families to potentially uh, learn a little bit more about endoscopic spine surgery and uh, and how it can help uh, relieve back pain and also in addition uh, what it can't do so <clears throat> Okay, so endoscopic spine surgery, what is the hype? And so I have no disclosures uh, for this talk. <clears throat> so I have a few slides here. Mostly I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna show some videos. The great thing about endoscopic spine surgery is that um, we're able to uh, record the entire surgery and um, show that to the patients. And, um, and so it's good to actually uh, give patients a an in-depth view of what their pathology is and was and um, you know, how it can treat other patients as well. Um, so it's termed ultra uh, minimally invasive surgery. And so many of you have heard um, the term minimally invasive surgery and that's often done with tubes, um, small incisions, usually anywhere in the range from um, 18 millimeters, uh, which is almost about two centimeters to um, about three centimeters. And um, <clears throat> and so typically I performed uh, what we call a microdiscectomy and we perform these um, via three centimeter incision and it's uh, termed an open procedure. Um, the term microdiscectomy comes from uh, using a microscope for the procedure and this allows you to better visualize the nerves, the spinal cord um, and, uh, and the pathology which is often you know a disc herniation or um, spinal stenosis and so um, uh, so less than a centimeter incision, um, is the size of the incision for an endoscopic spine surgery. And the picture on the right is actually, uh, one of my patients. Um, this was the incision, uh, two weeks after his surgery. And so you can tell it's already healed. Um, that's my thumb in a picture for a size reference. And, uh, it actually shrunk down, um, to even less than, or almost less than half a centimeter. And so, um, and he had no pain. Um, following a surgery, went home two hours after surgery. And um, again, this was performed at Ohio Valley. And so, um, so what kind of pathology can endoscopic spine surgery treat? And so we found that um, endoscopic spine surgery can be used to treat disc herniations um, and a lot of varieties of nerve compression um, can treat uh, spinal canal stenosis um, in certain cases, um, usually single level uh, disease. Um, and then a camera is used for visualization. Again, I'll show some um, images in a little bit of this. <clears throat> so what is the benefit? Um, so the benefit, the camera is uh, 15 or um, <clears throat> uh, 15 degree uh, camera. Um, there are 25, 30 degree cameras. And this means that the angle of the camera, so when you stick the camera in um, the angle, you're actually visual, uh, visualizing the area uh, 15 to 30 degrees off axis. And so what this does is it allows us to visualize areas um, that are hard to see with the naked eye or even with the microscope. So you can see around some corners. Um, and so things that you can't see through a conventional open procedure or even through a tube. Um, there's no muscle cutting. Um, it's a series of dilators. Uh, that uh, is used um, and again in an open procedure sometimes you have to strip the muscle away from the bone and this is where a lot of people get that pain from so um, patients go home two hours after surgery um, and so this is another benefit most patients uh, previously stayed the night um, for an open microdiscectomy 
Um, the picture on the uh, left side here um, is uh, myself performing an endoscopic spine surgery. And so you can see here, and I'll use my pointer, um, this is the camera here and then the working tube here and then the instruments um, go through the working tube. So everything is through one incision. This picture on the right is a zoomed in picture of a disc herniation that we removed um, with that procedure. So, um, and then minimal incisional care. So um, I super glue the incisions uh, following the surgery. Uh, dressings usually come off day three. Um, again, the incision less than a centimeter. So um, with the glue on the incision, um, you know, there's very minimal incision care uh, with that as well. Um, so some people have asked, uh, well, what is recovery like? Um, so recovery, I still tell my patients, um, I still maintain no bending, twisting, or lifting more than five pounds for six weeks. Um, when you tell the patients this, they kind of look at you like, well, I thought this was going to be a quicker recovery. It is, um, but I still just kind of have patients uh, take it easy for about six weeks just to make sure that we get their core strong again. Um, and prevent any recurrent disc herniations. There is obviously a small risk of a disc re-herniating. Uh, with the endoscopic procedure, those recurrence rates are even smaller than uh, a minimally invasive procedure or an open procedure. Uh, most patients are back at work, depending on your job. Um, if you're not a very heavy manual laborer within a week or two versus kind of the four to six weeks with an open procedure. Um, I have a lot of people that either work from home or office job or um, things like that. Um, I even had a, a hairstylist that I told her she could probably go back to work in about a week, um, provided she wasn't doing any heavy lifting. Um, and then minimal pain medicine. Uh, most people um, may take some narcotics for a day or two, or they may just take Tylenol or Tramadol. Um, and this is again, uh, versus kind of more prolonged uh, medication for an open procedure. Uh, so am I a candidate? So this is a, a good question uh, for people. Um, on my website, um, I do provide a link that you can upload your images if you wanted me to review your MRI images and see if you are a candidate and then um, bring you in for a more formal visit. Um, but endoscopic surgery, um, there are some surgeons out there that are doing um, fusions endoscopically. Um, this is not something that I've approached in my practice um, at this time. Um, so it's not really used to treat instability and instability meaning um, whether one bone is sliding over the other one, such as spondylolisthesis um, or any other types of instability. Um, again, that would, um, in some cases, a fusion is required for that. And, um, and it can be done endoscopically. Um, there's still research on, um, what the utility is in that. Um, so far that I've found that endoscopic surgery is best for um, stenosis type patients. So people that have nerve pinching due to bone spurs or disc herniations, um, uh, cases like that. Um, I did perform a endoscopic surgery on a patient that had spinal stenosis. Um, and so uh, it can be performed with cases like that. Um, in some cases it can even uh, prevent a patient from needing a fusion. So in the cervical spine and the neck, when it, people get a disc herniation, they most oftentimes undergo either a disc replacement or an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Um, in this case, it can be used uh, and you can do a small incision in the back of the neck, again, uh, less than one centimeter, and um, sometimes take the disc out uh, from the back. And again, uh, less than one centimeter incision back to work, you know, within a week or two. Um, and again, uh, being motion sparing and uh, prevents patients from sometimes needing a fusion. Now, this isn't in all cases of neck herniations, but um, it can be in a large uh, variety of, or large majority of patients, um, as well as those with even um, bony stenosis, meaning they have a bone spur in their neck that's pinching a nerve. Um, sometimes this can also be used for that as well. Um, it can also be used for thoracic disc herniations. Um, and whereas you needed at some point to treat a thoracic disc herniation, sometimes it was a huge surgery where you'd have to have a vascular surgeon come in and do the approach and do a fusion. Now, um, sometimes those disc herniations can be uh, taken care of 
uh, via an endoscopic surgery. So, so let me show um, a couple of videos here. <clears throat> So this is what we call a unilateral laminectomy for bilateral decompression. I'll kind of stop and go through this uh, real quickly, but this is just to give you an idea of what I see during the surgery. Um, some of this, um, I'll try to, to put this in layman's terms as much as possible, um, but this is the um, MRI of a patient. And again, it's cut in cross sections. So we're looking at the patient kind of cut in half, so to speak. Um, and this is the spinal cord here in the center. Um, and we can see that um, there is some spinal stenosis. And so um, this patient came to me presenting with um, back pain, pain down the legs, inability to walk long distances. Um, if you remember, I've given another talk on spinal stenosis. And so some of the, those are some of the symptoms. People endorse the shopping cart sign, uh, meaning that, you know, if you walk around the grocery store, you kind of have to lean on the shopping cart and that helps them feel better. Um, so if you have some of these symptoms, then this could potentially be of some benefit to you. So again, this is just an MRI, um, excuse me, from the side. And again, um, this area, the white part here is the spinal fluid. And this area here that's a little bit thin is the area where um, the stenosis is. And so So this is our high power drill. Um, it works at 8,000 revolutions per minute. And here in this area, I'm performing what we call laminotomy. And so this is basically a hole into the bone of the spine to access the spinal canal. And so, um, so we use this here. Again, this is the camera view that I see. So this big circle is the, my field of view. Um, all this tissue in here is kind of the bone. Um, again, I'm using this a drill bit to burn through that bone. So here we've kind of fast forward, we've gotten through the spinal canal. Um, I'm removing some of the tissue from the side of the bone um, to access the spinal canal further. <clears throat> And so here we've gone through the spinal canal. Now, this is the, and I'll show you in a second, that I'm using a instrument here to kind of release any um, stickiness from the nerves to the disc. And so I'll just pause this real quick. This is the nerve right here to the left of the screen. And so this is the L5 nerve. And so you can see how close I am people to see the nerve and everything around it. Um, this is actually the disc right below that my instrument is on. And this tissue to the right of the screen is um, some fat that surrounds the spinal cord and the nerve. So what I'm doing here is that this person also had a disc herniation as well that was causing some pinching of the spinal cord. And so I use the working tube and as you can see, um, the screen clears up a little bit here. This whole area is the disc now. And so now you don't see the nerve in view anymore. And so this is good. Um, this is good in the sense that now the nerve is protected behind the tube up here and I don't have to worry about it anymore. And so now I can just, I have the whole disc in my field of view and I can go ahead and um, what I did in this case was I actually shrunk the disc down. And so I used a special probe uh, that it emits uh, radio frequency signals and it kind of shrinks the disc down. <clears throat> and so this is that probe right here. And so it can shrink the disc down one to two millimeters. And this may not sound like a lot, but when you're working in the spinal canal and everything's tight, um, one to two millimeters can make a big difference uh, for people sometimes. So 
Okay, and so now in this view, we're actually, this whole area here in the center is the spinal cord. And so this is probably a view that uh, most people haven't seen. Um, and this is really a view that not a lot of surgeons see um, to this extent. A lot of times with the tube, you know, you're looking really far out. And so you're looking at a distance that's two or three feet into a tube, even with a microscope. Whereas here, I'm looking at it as if I was essentially right on top of it. and so. This is some fat that I'm removing here around the spinal cord. Um, again, the spinal cord is located here at the bottom. Um, and so you can see everything can be done really precisely. Um, and there's really low rates of um, any tears in the lining of the spinal cord, um, nerve damage, those um, kind of complications. This tissue here at the top of the screen here is what we call ligaments and flavum. And so this is the tissue that I describe in a clinic to my patients that this tissue can um, grow over time with arthritis. And so when we say, well, your arthritis is causing your spinal stenosis, what we mean is that it's either bony stenosis, meaning that there's bone that causes pinching of the spinal cord, or sometimes this ligament, this yellow stuff here at the top of the screen can grow in size as we get older and that can cause spinal stenosis as well. So what we do with a decompression or a laminectomy is uh, we remove all of that tissue so the spinal cord is free floating. <clears throat> and again, here I'm removing some more epidural fat. Um, actually, so through one incision, I'm actually through the other side of the spinal canal. And so, whereas sometimes you have to remove the entire lamina, I've actually done it to where I make a small hole on one side of the bone and actually tunnel under the bone um, rather than removing the bone in its entirety. So again, this whole procedure that you see here, you can see my wide field of view is through just less than a one centimeter incision. So. <clears throat> the drawback to this procedure is that um, in most hands, um, it does take somewhat longer than um, a traditional procedure. Um, that's open, um, but not by much. Um, I would say this procedure probably took me an hour and a half. Um, and so that's probably about roughly what time it takes me to do an open um, one level laminectomy. And so again, the one level laminectomies um, are fairly painful because of the muscle splitting, the muscle cutting that I have to remove from the bone, um, as well as the bone cutting. Now there is bone cutting in this procedure, but again, um, it is um, nowhere near as as painful as um, with a, with an open procedure. So again, I'm still working on this contralateral side. You can see the big pieces here that I remove um, with the uh, instruments here. <clears throat> and so what the, the probe itself, or not the probe, but the camera itself emits water um, approximately anywhere 45, 50 millimeters of mercury. And so this is enough to actually push the spinal cord out of my way. And so again, this is advantageous is that it's essentially helping me not cause any damage to the spinal cord. Um, and so you can see the indentation here um, and that's from the water pushing the spinal cord away. So, so now we've finished the decompression here. Um, you can see the entire spinal cord here, and so you can see that it's breathing well. Um, if you look closely, I don't know if you can see it kind of moving. That moves with the heartbeat, so the spinal cord uh, beats the same way as the heartbeat because the fluid is flowing through it. Um, you can see uh, the nerve you can see there at the bottom as well. So. <clears throat> Let's see, and I have another video I can show you.
So this is what we call, a, well, conventionally we call it a microdiscectomy, but in the endoscopic world, it is called a discectomy. And so again, we're removing that yellow ligament that I was talking about to access the spinal cord. Again, through a one centimeter incision here. <clears throat> And I'll fast forward it just for completeness sake. So here I'm using this probe again to control any bleeding. This yellow stuff you see here in the middle is fat that's covering the spinal canal. So I've already been able to access the spinal canal here. Here again, this is the spinal canal here. Um, this is some fat that's in my camera view there. Um, so I'm trying to mess with that. Again, um, spinal cord here, that's actually the, what we call the S1 nerve root. So again, I'm pushing away the nerve with my instrument, and this is actually the disc space right below. And so the disc herniation is going to be in our field of view in a minute. So um, some of you may wonder, well, what happens when you're pushing on the nerve like that? Well, I remove enough tissue to be able to push the nerve without damaging it. And again, uh, the working tube is almost really no bigger than a pen. Um, and so um, some people may get some transient numbness following their surgery, um, but again, no different than you would partic um, maybe particularly with an open procedure. And so um, again, not damaging to the nerve itself. Mm -mm. Okay, well, we'll get to the good part here. Um, so again, this is the S1 nerve root. Uh, you'll never see the nerve in that uh, close of a view. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm turning my tube to retract the nerve root out of my way. So it's um, not in my way when I start taking out the disc. And this is the disc here. If you can see, it kind of pops out a little bit there, like a pimple. And so you can see this big ball here, and that's the disc herniation. <clears throat> And so now all those structures, the nerve um, and any other important structures are out of the way, the spinal cord's out of the way, and then I can go ahead and start taking out the disc here. And so you can see that big chunk right there, that is the disc herniation. This guy came to me um, quite a bit of pain. He's a younger gentleman in his late 20s, mid 20s, late 20s. Um, severe pain, um, has a fiance, has kids at home. Um, and so um, I offered to do his surgery um, endoscopically and, uh, and he was all for it. And so he went home two hours after surgery um, said he had minimal pain and soreness following that. And I saw him back in the thing in two weeks. He was actually the first picture I showed you um, with a small incision. And so, um, and so again, um, he was able to get back to work uh, within a week or two um, and no issues. So endoscopic spine surgery also alleviates the need for really invasive procedures such that once you get a spine surgery, sometimes the more bony work you do or the more bone you remove, um, it can further degenerate that level. Um, once it disc herniates, that level is already degenerative, but um, performing a discectomy or alleviating stenosis endoscopically um, can hopefully slow down the rate of degeneration of that particular level. So, so again, see, we're still removing disc. And so, um, then I actually am able to burn the hole where the disc came out from and hopefully shrink that down. And so that also helps um, lower some rates of recurrent herniation. So again, the rates of recurrent herniation in a disc in a endoscopic surgery are lower than conventional uh, procedures. And so again, now you can see the nerve is 
decompressed. The spinal cord is beating right there in the side. You can see um, the nerve looks happy. And, um, and then we're done with our procedure. So. <clears throat> All right, so if anybody has any questions, um, you know, let me know. Um, I kind of want to make this short and um, informal. And also to just kind of give people um, an idea of what endoscopic spine surgery is. You know, I, I advertise a lot, I talk about a lot, and, um, you know, some people don't know what it is. And so, um, so this is a good avenue to, um, hopefully get people a little bit more aware of what it is. Um, we are only performing this at Ohio Valley Surgical Hospital. Um, and it's actually a great hospital for that in a sense that um, really we've really just started performing outpatient spine surgery. And so, um, you know, people come in, um, it's easy to get in, easy to get out. Um, and so, um, you know, I've had lots of success with um, uh, performing this procedure at a surgical hospital. Um, I think that any ambulatory surgical center um, or um, surgical hospital is a great uh, avenue for doing an endoscopic spine surgery. So. Polly has been on my, uh, she posted a comment here exploring options for her family member. Um, she's been one of my webinar supporters in the past. Uh, thank you for watching. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, you can find more information um, at uh, on my website, endoscopicspinesurgery.com, um, molinaspine.com. You can follow me on my Facebook page. Um, I'm very receptive to email. Um, you know, a lot of people I don't, think they realize that my email address is on my website and I do check that personally. Um, so feel free to email me there if you have any questions or message me on Facebook. I get a lot of people that message me um, and, I, and I don't mind it at all. Um, and so, like I said, if you do have an MRI uh, that you would like me to review, you can upload it to my website as well, free of charge. Um, it's HIPAA secure, so you don't have to worry about um, any of that. Um, and then we can always make an appointment following that um, to go over, uh, you know, your particular case. So um, there are also um, other surgeons at Ohio Valley that are performing endoscopic spine surgery. Dr. Tigger um, is performing it as well. Um, and that kind of does um, beg the question or the comment, um, who can perform endoscopic spine surgery? Um, I'm a fellowship trained spine surgeon. Um, Dr. Tigger is a fellowship trained spine surgeon. Um, there are not very many fellowship trained spine surgeons in Ohio. Um, I believe I am one of three or four in Ohio in the entire state. There are several pain doctors that um, perform endoscopic spine surgery. Um, and so when you're searching out a particular surgeon, um, just make sure that you, um, you know, check to see if they've, um, whoever they may be, um, that they've um, done some cases and, um, you know, been trained appropriately. So, um, but again, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know and thank you for watching. <clears throat>